Janice Arnold-Jones, thanks for joining us. It is a privilege, Sarah. Thank you. All right, let's get started. New Mexico is one of the poorest states in the nation. About 22% of people here are living in poverty. What would you do in Washington, D.C. to represent those New Mexicans who are facing the greatest obstacles with poverty? Well, first off, uh, the, the most important thing I can do in Washington is to help get our economy moving. And in New Mexico, the first step is making sure that we pass a budget. Our, we have a federally dependent budget, uh, economy in this state. And so passing a budget not only means that people will get paychecks immediately, but it also means that, that we're moving along their certainty. And so our small businesses that support the federal sector are actually operating. Got to have a budget. What about the private sector? You've spoken about the need to grow the private sector mm -hmm. and, and have more jobs here in New Mexico. How would you propose growing the private sector here? Well, a couple of things, and you need to understand some of these are New Mexico issues from the congressional level, things that will help immediately, is pulling back regulation. And when I say pull back regulation, uh, for the federal contractors, here's an example. Uh, when you are bidding on contracts to support our entities here, you have to do things like, it's called uh, reps and certs. It's a ton of paper that you have to copy and do every single contract. Why not provide that online? Do it once a year. Those are steps that would actually help businesses immediately. Those kinds of regulations and processes we can actually streamline. And simplifying our tax code so that we are not spending so much time doing cost of compliance, which sucks about 20% of revenue out of most people's business. What about the balance of making sure that there are enough regulations in place to avoid another economic meltdown? Um, well, I'm not sure that the regulation alone, clearly as, as we look at our history, that the regulation actually prevented a meltdown. Uh, I look at Dodd-Frank, we put Dodd-Frank in as a result of, of Wall Street, but all of the things that we have used to intervene actually created other problems. Dodd-Frank right now is literally choking our home loan industry. Um, the impact and the unintended consequences on appraisers, who knew, but appraisers is actually shutting down deals immediately because of the way that the funding is working. So regulation should be supporting the activity, not getting in the way. And if you respond with a knee-jerk reaction to the market, that's usually what happens. The federal government is a big employer in New Mexico. What do you see for the future of the federal government's involvement in the uh, economy here in the state? Well, for the near ter term, it is still going to have play a major role. I would like to see us diversify our economy, and one of the fastest ways to diversify our economy is to use our natural resources for the aid of our country. Not only are we oil and gas rich, we have timber, uh, which surprisingly, we, you know, we actually killed off our own timber industry uh, in the early 70s with the spotted owl incident. But the truth is, is that um, building industries across the country need timber. We have timber. So timber is one. Mining. We have rare earth elements in the state of New Mexico. It is an essential component for most high-tech manufacturing entities. China cut us off about four months ago. Why not New Mexico? We are better stewards of the land than any other state that I know of, and it's an essential product that is needed. Another major issue is immigration. Immigration mm -hmm. reform hasn't been passed in Congress so far. Uh, President Obama put in place deferred action, which was similar to a proposal in the DREAM Act, which is not passed in Congress. And, and you've expressed some concerns about that, about that executive order. Can you speak to where you felt like the president overstepped his bounds and what you feel should be done in Congress to address immigration? Well, absolutely. I do think his ex executive order overstepped the bounds. I believe Congress should have done their job and stood up and said no. Um, what is missing in this discussion is the discussion. And so when you look at the discussion of immigration right now, we're completely polarized. You're either talking about amnesty or you're talking about shipping back 12 million people. I don't think either, dis either part of that is productive. It is time to look at other answers. And so specifically, the, the section that the president tried to enact was to give some protection to children who were brought to this country by parents who entered illegally. Now, the way that it was done, I, I actually think that there are some other options that should be looked at. And one is, why not, for these children, provide civics classes on the path to citizenship in high school so that if they choose to be a US citizen, they declare that early, they pass all of those tests, when they graduate, they also become a citizen, rather than doing what we're doing. 
Would you put that in a DREAM Act proposal? Do you think that that's something that could be passed in Congress where their agreement could be found? Well, I do. One, I, I think, is when you get off of these two extreme positions, because there are other things to talk about here in the ways to address immigration. But part of the DREAM Act actually was uh, access uh, additional access to uh, education funds at the college level that many New Mexican students who didn't have this problem wouldn't have access to. That's not right. Mm. You also mentioned in the KME debate the Braceros program, which mm -hmm. was um, it has has stopped in the 1960s. You mentioned maybe we could bring it back. Do you think that there should be a path to citizenship if there was a guest worker program like Braceros, where people who wanted to become citizens could? Well, I'm, I, I'm not sure that the Braceros program was really supposed to be a path to citizenship. It was literally guest working and it, it, it tracked people coming in, people going out. Uh, and I think that we are still going to need that. One of the things, one of the questions that I ask all the time is, we, we have banks that can track people fraudulently using your credit card, but our own border forces cannot track whether or not your visa, your student visa is expired or not. Why is that? I think we, that's something we have to fix. And that's part of border security, but it's also part of this immigration question. Do you think adding more uh, visas for temporary workers would be part of comprehensive immigration, for, or should be part of comprehensive immigration? Well, I, I think any visa program needs to be trackable. Uh, and, and I think I mentioned during the KME debate um, that I actually had a friend who um, came and, and overstayed her visa. She tried everything to make sure that she was legal, but she had married an American soldier they have had a baby, and we could do nothing, and she was returned to her own country with an American child. Now, what sense does this make? And we often forget that other countries have a say over their human capital, so it was more than two years before she could return to this country to her husband with that American child. Are you hopeful that immigration reform could be passed in Congress? You know, I am, I, because one, I believe that we need to raise the caps. I think we have more intellectual capital that could come to our country that would help us. And so, but getting off of amnesty or just shipping people out, got to get off of that track. And I have a lot of different answers that I think we ought to talk about. I think a lot of people would call you a, a moderate Republican, and I'm wondering, um, you talked in the debate about a perceived lack of support from the Republican Party, and particularly from Governor Martinez. Have you received any reports since that debate, <laughs> any additional support from the party? Well, I would say, so what I should have added is there are Republicans all across this state who have been working with me and helping me. There is only this very small part of the Republican Party that seems to make the news that are at odds with the fact that I am going to operate straight up in the sunshine, and, and I'm not going to change that. But that is a very small portion, and I probably did a disservice by not commenting on how many Republicans have been working with me for well over 18 months. Do you think that this year is the, the last best chance for Republicans to take back the first district congressional seat? They've held it for all but four years of its existence. Exactly right. Uh, well, it's just a fact that if you are not the incumbent, the, long, the more time that exists, the harder the ground. And it's very difficult to plow that ground. So um, I, that's why I need to be elected this time. I believe I'm a much better match for this district, not only by my, ma my background, having been a DOE contractor, my association with the military, uh, but as a legislator. One more issue that's going to be very important in Congress is the Affordable Care Act health care reform. If elected to Congress, what would you, how would you vote to protect or repeal parts of that legislation? Do you know, I'm on record for not uh, really loving this particular act. Uh, it, it is a log rolled piece of legislation. Uh, many people had not read it before they voted on it, which is just gets my ire. Uh, but there are pieces, you know, and, and you could say repeal all of it. There are some very good pieces. The best strategy may be to take out the pieces that are not good. There are 159 brand new taxes that I think are really going to surprise people. I don't like that. The IPAD, the um, Independent Patient Advisory Board, is very problematic to me. And so maybe, but in order to keep the pieces that I like, I like having dealt with pre-existing conditions. I like being able to have my daughter who is in law school on the other side of the country on my insurance policy. Um, I like the additional competition that was created. All of those are good things. But there are other pieces that are bad in it. The 27% uh, reduction in reimbursement to our providers will impact care that people need. And so it is a balance. So you could go either way, but 
probably the better way is to correct what is there. And what's the best way to keep health care costs down? You know, I, I, I struggle with that question, and, and here's why I struggle with it. Uh, I'm a business person. I know that to provide a service, I have three components. I have service, quality, and cost. To say that we are going to keep health care costs down, then my suspicion is always that quality and service is going to suffer. There is not a model that we have talked about yet that has really reduced cost, but that has absolutely reduced service and quality. So I'm not sure that we're asking the right question. I think what we're seeking is really good health care. And when you have good health care, cost is a part. Janice Arnold-Jones, thanks for joining us. Thank you.